Well, let's just start with a little 10 minute um, sit just to that we all have a chance to really arrive and then we can um, begin our discussion. So just make yourself as comfortable as you can. Um, and really please remember just to bring your whole self into the room. Every, every aspect is welcome. We can begin by just appreciating uh, the effort it took to be here tonight and really, really appreciating the follow through that so often in our lives, we have really good intentions to do something and life just gets in the way. We forget, we get overcommitted. And so when we're really able to follow through on an intention and coming together to practice and discuss the paramis to do something that's beneficial not only for ourselves but is beneficial to each other and to wider circles it's really worthwhile to just take in the good as my friend rick hansen says we have you know, sort of Velcro for self-critical judgments. And we seem to have Teflon for, uh, for kind of self-appreciation. So just take a minute to really appreciate that you got here. And then just choose whatever practice will most help you arrive here completely, to settle in, to be engaged. And that might be loving kindness. It might be a mindfulness practice engaged with the breath or body awareness. And some people even like to start by doing a body scan, a kind of quick body scan. So whatever would be most supportive for the next 12 minutes or so. Just allow yourself to do that.
I'm really happy to have you all here this evening. And um, before we begin our discussion of um, the eighth parami resoluteness, I just wondered if anyone wanted to report anything from last week's practice with uh, truthfulness. I just wonder if anyone had any, any story or anything that really um, kind of popped out. Yeah, it was interesting. Um, I had a circumstance that was unfolding in my life that was very challenging in terms of a conflict. And um, I got very, very lost in, um, in a stream of thinking, a narrative, incredible amount of judgmentalness that then morphed into a whole full-blown story that I got very invested in about somebody else's values and had to have this discussion. And after um, our discussion here last week on the paramis and noting the five questions or four questions um, really just brought me back to the present moment and everything just melted away, literally. Um, once I just sat with each of those questions in relationship and in tandem with this awareness that my mind is a mess. <laughs> and the only thing that will address this is practice. And, and, just, and, and I listened to um, an MBSR teacher colleague with a meeting that I do with some frequency and she was talking about a scenario that happened years ago. And um, in, in doing this, and it really got very connected with truthfulness and um, that, that in those moments when I get caught up, if I just keep coming back to grounding in the present moment and all of the sensory experience of the present moment, every time I launch into that being invested and asking myself those questions is just an incredibly powerful practice. And I went into from lost and messiness to calm and ease and equanimity. And I was able to have that conversation with a great deal of openness and compassion and equanimity for the situation and everything that everyone was dealing with. So um, the, the particular pair of me was so opportune for me. And I thank you, Patrice. It was perfect landing for me. Thank you. Well, that sounds really serendipitous. And, and thank you for um, telling that, that story, that's really heartening. It's always so um, helpful to us when we hear from each other how, how, these, uh, how this is working out in our lives. Yeah. And Ten tonight's parami, um, I have found that, that um, I got more and more interested in it as I was thinking about it and learning about it this week. And it's the parami of resoluteness. That in, in Pali, it's Aditana, A-D-I-T-T-H-A-N-A. -A. Um, and it means determination, um, especially in following through on an aspiration. Um, sometimes it's uh, associated with being unwavering. Um, it often has in the, in the Pali Canon a connection with faith, but we can just um, think about it in our own lives as, um, as this quality of being resolute. And um, when I was thinking about it, originally I sort of, well, how do I think about it? I just sort of think, okay, so, you know, that sort of Nike thing, you know, just, just do it. You know, you've got this um, aspiration or um, in sort of more mundane material matters, you might have a goal about doing something and, and sort of just do it. And as I <coughs> read more, particularly reading some uh, reflections of, of Joseph Goldstein, he said, you know, you have your, your aspiration, but the really important part of it is figuring out what's really needed to achieve it. So it's not that kind of just do it, 
just go for it. But it's really being reflective and contemplative and really understanding what will be involved in, um, in your resoluteness, in your effort to, um, to realize that aspiration. And then the other part of it is developing wisdom as progress is made. And I'm going to talk about all three of them. So there are these three components. There's the aspiration, having this aspiration. And the second part is figuring out what's really needed to achieve the aspiration or to work toward that, that aspiration. So what do you, what, what's required for you to make some progress? And then the last part is, are you really developing some wisdom as you're uh, in your resoluteness? So it's not that, that kind of just, just go for it. There, it has a much more reflective component in it. So, you know, aspirations can be, you know, extremely mundane. And usually when they're, they're really mundane, we call them goals, you know, like a goal of, um, you know, maybe getting to the gym twice a week when it was possible to get to the gym. Um, so you can have some really mundane sort of, of, um, of aspirations, but you know, you, your aspiration might be something as simple as establish um, what um, Dan Harris calls a daily-ish meditation practice. And that way you don't hate yourself when you, when you miss a day, but you know, having a, a practice, um, your aspiration might be to strengthen one of the paramis in your life. You, know, you might really see that, um, you know, that, that patience would be such an important parami. And then, you know, what, what would it take to really strengthen uh, the parami? Um, you know, right now, one of my aspirations is to make a real contribution um, to racial justice and equity um, in, my, in my neighborhood, in my, in my city. Um, you might have an aspiration, you know, to live more sustainably, to live in a way that is um, less detrimental in terms of everything that's that's consumed. So, when we have an aspiration, we need some specificity about it. It doesn't have to be a fully formed vision. But you know, if if I were to say, well, what I really want to do is get enlightened. And I had, that's all I knew about it. I wouldn't make much progress. But if I, I, if I said, I really would like to sort of be enlightened or to, I actually don't use that phrase. I used to, I really would like to wake up, wake up in this lifetime. Um, but my understanding then is that would really mean letting go of greed, hatred, and delusion. So it's not just that I want to be this awakened person. What it would mean to realize my goal is that I would have to let go of, of greed, hatred, and, um, and delusion. So we can think about our aspiration and think about you know, what it might look like to realize that, that aspiration. You know, like as, as I think about issues of um, racial equity and economic equity, you know, I'm thinking really clearly about you know, sort of housing equity, health equity, legal equity and, and looking um, you know, reparations. You know, it, it's trying to be more um, specific in my understanding of what that, um, what that aspiration is. And then the next step is, you know, what will it take? What are gonna be the causes and conditions that, um, that allow me to do this or allow any of us to do it. So is it an issue of time? Is it of space, resources, sacrificing something? Um, I've been in, in a Common Ground Sutta group now for a decade and a half at least. And um, right now we're working on um, a book about jhana practice and concentration practice. And it's something that I aspire 
to be able to practice. I would really like to do concentration practice. And um, I think the conditions for that will be some, at least some time of seclusion um, where I don't have other responsibilities. I am not connected by my phone or the computer when I just really have some solitude and more, um, you know, conditions that would really support the mind just settling. And so right now, that's just not in the cards. I, I would usually be doing my retreat the last couple of weeks in June at Koinia, and that's not possible. And, um, and Mark said to me, oh, why don't you just come out to Prairie Farm, come out to Prairie Farm for a couple of days. And I actually, um, until the little dog that I have um, is willing to have someone else in the family touch her and that, that uh, you know, she can, uh, she'll be fed by, she can go outside. I mean, right now she's, she's, it's like having a small child who is just so dependent on one person that I think I just can't leave for a couple of days. I will be able to eventually, but not now. So you know, it's that kind of, of thinking really specifically about you know, what, what are the sort of conditions that will um, support this. And one of the conditions might be making a real sacrifice. And, and this is a paraphrase of what the Buddha said, but he said, wisdom is letting go of a lesser good for a greater good. So it may be that in an aspiration that we that we have that we have to give up something that is good and fun and you know um, a kind of wholesome thing to do but um we can't do that and uh have our other aspiration so you know and it might be you know you may have an aspiration around um, food or health or something, something else. So, you know, this idea that really understanding in order to make progress on that, uh, on that aspiration, um, you'll have to have to do things differently and you may have, may have to give something up. So it might be <clears throat> um, getting up early in, in the morning so that you can meditate. Um, you know, in, in peace. It might be um, turning down, you know, um, I mean, one thing I do in the evening a lot of times is um, I watch uh, Parks and Rec with my husband. And uh, it seems very wholesome and, and harmless. And, um, but, you know, if I really wanted to sit at night, I should give that up because after that, I'm ready to go to bed. So, but it's a really nice thing for the two of us to last last thing at night watch watch Parks and Rec. Um, you know, for some things, it just takes a lot of repetition too. Um, for some things that we're um, we would like to to accomplish, um, we have to be willing to be really mediocre at least for a while. And that sometimes is, is really hard. Although I think everyone who's ever stuck to a meditation practice has experience with just sitting with the mind that is just all over the place and how um, humiliating uh, that is. But often it's, um, you know, it's really, uh, it's really, really challenging. Um, I've been taking Chinese painting now for about three years, and I'm always amazed that someone who just started six months ago uh, comes in and their calligraphy is so much better than mine. I mean, I'm just, it, it's, it's just, you know, it, it's, it's ongoing and it's humbling, and I think, okay, and I will just stick to this. But it, it's also, I'll tell um, it occurred to me at some point in my, I'd say the last 20 years, probably through meditation, that I'd really um, missed out 
on some things in life because if I started something and it wasn't clear to me from the get-go that I would be very good at it, I didn't even try. You know, I wasn't willing to be a mediocre tennis player. Um, you know, and I've just thought about how I, um, having that sense, if I'm not going to be really good at it, I'm just not even going to try to do it. And because I'm, I'm physically a very small person, that has really kind of ruled out a whole bunch of, of sports or anything that's, that's a team sport, because I thought I would, you know, I will never be the really good person at this. And it's a really, you know, on reflection, it's just a really self-limiting um, view, and, and it's kept me from learning a lot of things. And I think that's why this, um, painting class has been so helpful for me in, uh, and it's not like, oh, I've, I've spent two years and suddenly I'm just zooming right up there at the top. Not the case at all. I think I am always going to be a pretty mediocre calligrapher and painter. But what I've learned to enjoy is the absorption of it. And it's partly because I'm not very good at it that I really have to pay attention all the time. And that's what I learned from it. You know, that, that's been a really important thing to learn. So that's kind of the, the wisdom part here that, that has come out a little bit, that, that I didn't expect, um, and we know from meditation that absorption really is such a pleasure. Um, but um, so it's, it's the pleasure of absorption, not, not the finished product um, at all. And that has been a really important um, uh, learning for me. And, and when we engage in something with resolution, I think it is such an opportunity to learn about the habits of the heart and mind, you know, which is, is sort of what meditation teaches us over and over, that we learn we really get a chance to see the habits of, of the heart and mind. Um, and it's, um, you know, when we practice resolute, uh, resoluteness, we develop resilience, which is you know, an incredibly important thing at this time. And I think what really undermines our, our effort to do something with resolution is not anticipating, you know, sort of what it's going to take. You know, I'm just kind of diving into something with an aspiration and not anticipating what it's going to take. And um, you know, so in some of the anti-racism work that I've been doing is so much of it, so much of it has been going back and uncovering and unpacking whiteness and white um, assumptions about how things, uh, how things should be, expectations, norming, and, um, you know, that's just been, um, and I feel really um, determined to do that work, but it's in, um, in service of a longer aspiration. And I think when I started this, I honestly didn't understand how much of it would be about um, unpacking something in myself, I thought it would be much more, um, you know, sort of this joyful coming together, you know, together we will bend the moral arc of history in this, in this lovely, um, friendly kind of way. And it's been much more challenging um, than that. So I just offer that to you. Um, as something that I'm really learning about being resolute. Um, and, and I get to practice it this week in trying to, you know, like meet with my city council person to talk about uh, like the next thing that should happen with the MPD. So, you know, like really kind of commit to the long run, try to be skillful, try to learn stuff along the way and not, not be so tight about what a particular outcome should look like. I mean, that's the other thing about our aspiration. It's not being, 
it's, as I mentioned um, a couple of times ago, you know, I've had this practice of saying, make, make room for not knowing. So when I have my aspiration, I always want to have a little part of that that I don't know completely what this is going to look like. And so I'm not hanging on to um, how it should be. And that's more of an, an, um, an expectation. So you might think about making a distinction in your own mind between expectations, which are usually pretty um, clear about how something should turn out and an aspiration for a more, um, I'll say more fluid, but an aspiration for uh, a vision or a goal that you have in mind, but you're not entirely wedded to exactly what this is going to look like. Um, and um, what I've been thinking about for the past day or two is, you know, when we talk about practice, we have an aspiration to practice for the benefit of all beings. And like, I really sometimes just think about, so what do I mean by that? For the benefit of all beings, for future beings. Um, and, um, you know, I think about um, persons who are um, really difficult um, to feel much um, tenderness toward. Um, and I think in my heart of hearts, I would really like that person to wake up. I would really like that person to, um, to be realized. So we can have these larger um, aspirations too. And, and um, you know, if you think about the bodhisattva um, aspiration or our aspirations maybe in practicing the precepts. So this, this just seemed to me to be really um, a very rich topic um, for this week, especially that idea about you know, really understanding what will it take to make progress in this, to accomplish this, and the wisdom part. Am I learning along the way? Am I really developing some um, some insight, some understanding, and it may be understanding about how my mind works. It might be understanding of what it is you're trying to to accomplish. A deeper insight into that. But I just found that this sort of three part um, approach really helpful. So I would love to hear um, your ideas um, about this. So just unmute yourself and jump in. I, I just want to point out the question that you asked Puri, uh, Patrice um, really landed for me and it's something that I definitely plan to work with and that is what did I miss out on in life because I didn't really try and really spending some time with that and all of the layers of um, reactivity, emotions, all of that comes along with that. So thank you for bringing that into the mix. Complicating. You're welcome. Hi. Um, I, I like a lot of what you've just said, Jason, I'm remembering Two things. The thing that occurred to me as you spoke was how I, in particular, but many people, regardless of race, can be, um, bad word, undermined by inadvertent uh, uh, someone who uh, doesn't share my vision or my, my aspiration in this case and uh, may put me down. It could be a parent, it could be a teacher, it could be just a friend. But I have a, here's a great example. I uh, attended a talk given by Pamela Alexander 
who is, uh, was appointed by Perpich as a judge. But prior to that, she was a lawyer. And prior to that, she had been involved with a friend of hers uh, out in the town or something like that. And uh, her friend, even though she was with her friend, her friend got assaulted and raped. The reason she did not was because she had a cap on and her hair was very short. So the person who perpetrated this didn't realize that she was a she. What, what Pamela Anderson got out of that, and she's a black person, was that uh, eventually the person was caught and she was like 12, 13, 14 maybe. And uh, she went home to her parents and told them what happened. And they agreed that she had to, if the person was caught, which happened, um, would she be comfortable, you know, testifying and so forth. And she was, and she did that. And she had the encouragement of her parents. And eventually the, the, the person who was uh, a perpetrator was convicted and sent to jail. So she, in the court process, admired and liked the procedure, what was going on in court, what the lawyers were doing, both back and forth and the judge and so forth. And at some point she shared this with her parents and they said, well, go for it more or less, you know, and, and supported her in that. And eventually she did and she went for it and became a lawyer and eventually got appointed a, a sort of judgeship by purpose. Uh, and in court, uh, one day, um, a person came in before her who was uh, charged with a crime. And uh, she saw him and the back, back and forth between lawyers and the judge and so forth. And she turned to the perpetrator in this particular crime and she said, do you remember me? And he looked at her and said, no, why should I? Well, it happened that this was the same person that had perpetrated the rape on her friend when she was a child. And um, uh, it was serendipity, the words you use, that after so many years, um, the process of being in court was so um, inf influential for her and so, per so supported by her parents that she went right through and became a judge you know, on top of it. But what was so um, astonishing in the whole thing was that the crime that happened that put her in a position to be a part of the court system happened to her as a judge with the very same person. And uh, the person was convicted. I didn't ask her, could she, should she have recused herself from that or whatever? But at some point, I mean, it was so startling that someone from her age of 13 or 14 who committed a crime should come back into her life when she's an adult and a judge and has to deal with that. Uh, and it was, I, I guess the story itself was so, I mean, it's so surprising, number one, and serendipitous. And it, for me, it was an inspiration in the sense of, um, for myself, but if I aspire to something, um, as you were saying, don't rule it out or don't let anyone else rule it out for you. you know, stick with it. And that is such a great lesson. I mean, um, and I, I only learned that more recently as a volunteer. I was volunteering at the time that Pamela gave that talk, Pamela Alexander. It's just remarkable. So thank you for the teaching. It reminds me of that and uh, the resolution of one's aspiration. I really, I appreciate the story. Thank you. Yeah, Therese, um, Patrice. Um, I was just wondering about the uh, determination. Like I kind of came into this practice through the yoga side. And I think it's in the Bhagavad Gita where they talk about you can choose your work but you're not entitled to the fruits of that work. Hmm. Um, that, and what I was just thinking of is, so 
people like if you have a resolution, you know, to make beautiful calligraphy, you know, that, that uh, touches you, you know, that somehow there's something to be able to express yourself through calligraphy. There's a lot of unpleasant things, you know, that happened before then. Or like I have a friend that's learning how to play the cello. She wants to, you know, make beautiful cello music. But when you're learning an instrument, you, you're kind of um, committing to a lifetime of doing scales and arpeggios and studies. And the only way you're going to get to that goal of making beautiful music is to find joy for every little piece that goes in there. Um, so I was just wondering if, um, so like resolution is, there's a lot of hard work and like maybe a key to getting there is, you know, can you, you know, aspire to somebody where that hard work is going to be the joy. I mean, the joy is in the hard work and whether or not you reach that goal, you know, it's kind of beyond your control. Thanks. I think that that, that is, um, part of it is really learning to appreciate the effort. You know, that, that I, I think, um, you know, sometimes when you're learning stuff or learning stuff physically, just learning to um, appreciate that, that effort. And there's some joy in, in that. You know, as I mentioned, like the joy of, of absorption for me has been, that, that's really pleasant. And um, so often when we're doing things and things that are difficult, it is often helpful to see if there's any, any part of it that's pleasant. Um, and um, you know, I, I, um, I sometimes, if, if I have a, a resolution to do or not to do something, you know, at the end of the day, I, I say to myself, you know, well, Patrice, okay, so, you know, you, uh, you got in all your steps today, or, you know, you refrain from doing that. But it's also sort of that little reflection that we're able to, um, to appreciate our own efforts. And I think that that's, um, that's really helpful. And sometimes the, the appreciation is just, I said I was going to do it. And I stuck with it, you know, and, and just appreciating that. So I think that that sort of um, appreciation can be a useful part of um, determination. Um, and, uh, you know, and having the sort of maturity often to say, okay, I'm in this for the long run. You know, I mean, that's another thing. I'm just, you know, this is, this is not, this is not a sprint. This is a marathon. And just to have that, that sort of sense of, um, you know, a kind of maturity about, about things, I think it can be really, um, really helpful. But I like that idea that you, you mentioned, Kevin, about sort of appreciating, see what you can appreciate in the doing of it. So that it's not just always for, um, or what your eventual aspiration is. And I think that's part of the wisdom, you know, sort of learning as you're doing it, paying attention and seeing what you can learn from the doing of it. Um, so many things. Um, you started off, Patrice, saying about wholeness. And this this day I've been reading about uh, with Parker Palmer, a book again, finished it. Uh, talking about being whole with all the broken pieces of your whole life and having all of the various parts of your life, if you can integrate them all, you, you, you live with a, a great ferocity, a great fire. And um, so that again is a, um, with what you'd said from the very beginning, really resonating with me. Um, many things resonate. Um, the hard work, when I, um, the hard work of sticking with something when, um, you know, and there's many things I've stuck with and ended up achieving um, and just staying with it. But one thing that's come up, talked about music. When I was a young man, 18, 19, um, I had a resolution because I was in, in London and uh, 
a resolution to, to work to be in a band and be a professional musician because it's one way to get out of uh, factory work and all the, all the things that were um, I would do otherwise. So um, I come out of working in, you know, in, in jobs that were what we would call dead end jobs and just buy, mu buy musical instruments and practice. And um, that it was one of those roads that didn't happen in that way. Um, but it was something that even today I've come back to and, um, and you know, relates to what you were talking about with calligraphy because I, I've determined to practice you know, at least a few times a week back to flute playing. And, um, and even I've, I've never been able to read music well. And, I've, <laughs> and that could have put me off forever because it seems as if something in my brain just doesn't see the notes in the way that many, it, many people see it. Uh, but I improvise. And so um, it's interesting for me because when I play from reading, I play like a beginner. But then when I improvise, it's really, really different. And so I have come back to that practice, though, as um, Kevin was saying, the joy of just practicing um, certain things on um, to keep the keep the you know tone play and um, and and scales and things like that. Um, so um, I I really appreciate this discussion and. Um, Another thing that's come up this week, um, as Lorna and I sometimes have worked in uh, with our mon with money issues and money, <laughs> but especially as a young man, money just I didn't seem to have much money, um, and I was often doing things with, and not 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 getting paid um, for actually a lot of my twenties, not getting any money, very much money at all, um, and that I've come back to. And saying like goals, or as you had said, you know, aspirations. And we went through some that Lorna and I did five years ago, and we realized, yeah, many of those things we we have stuck with. And um, you know, it's just um, it's just been been wonderful looking for me looking back at myself at 18, 19 when I was struggling. Um, and looking back now in my 60s and saying, you know, many of those things are really, um, you know, integrated in my in my experience. So um, stuck with it, you know. So this is this has uh, been great to talk about about it again, and appreciate seeing people uh, here who I haven't seen in, in in many years. So good to see you again. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Patrice. Um, I really like the topic. And it's uh, at first I was thinking of, you know, like New Year's resolutions and how these resolutions are made. And I finally gave up on making New Year's resolutions because, you know, that just wasn't where it was. Mm -hmm. But I'm thinking about like in the, with the Dharma practice and how important the idea of, you know, having resolutions, being resolute, as you said, and determined um, because it is a hard it is a hard practice and as the years go by you know I look at it and, I, and as you as you were saying and other people have said this too about not wanting to do anything unless we're good at it and you know this is a humbling experience and it's particularly humbling because I had gone I had started in a Tibetan tradition which is different and this and I, I'm much more happy, uh, comfortable, and gravitating toward the insight meditation Theravada. It's just more humbling. It's more difficult. It's much more difficult for me because it's being inside. It's going really going inside and being with me as opposed to the, all the con contemplative meditation that you can do in Tibetan and guru meditation. So it's really a humbling experience. So I, I appreciate that and, and, the st and the desire to stick with it. But one of the things I just want to present a, a slightly different slant is to know when it's not working and to be able to say, to give, even though I said, oh, I was going to do this. You know, for example, I had joined a class in Sarasota where I live for this Tibetan group, but I, 
I don't want to go to the class. I don't like the classes and it's not the right tradition, but I had joined it and I'm thinking, well, you should do that. And then to say, no, you know, be able to let that go. So there's kind of a balance between yes, it, that wasn't quite the right aspiration. And I just have to kind of shift around it. No, this is the aspiration I want. This is what I'm looking for. And one more thing I, I just wrote down, wisdom is letting go of a lesser good for a greater good. And that's really important because mm -hmm. sometimes we don't have time to do all these things. And we don't have time to have, you know, million relationships and still be a good practitioner and to be able to let some of these things go. So I just appreciate your saying that. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. And I have a wonderful example. I come from a background where money was really tight. And, you know, if you, you know, if, if you signed up for a course and you paid for it, by God, you took it no matter how miserable you were. If you, if you spent good money and I knew this person and, um, she talked, she said, I went to two classes. She said, no, I just didn't like it. And I was just stunned. And I said, but you paid for it. And she said, that was my tuition to find out if this was something I wanted to do. And I thought that was just an amazing, liberating. So that would, that would be kind of a hard thing for me to do, but it was just a really different way of of looking at it, of saying, you know, I, I, I paid for this because I wanted to find out, is this something I would enjoy? Is this something I wanted to do? I've never forgotten it. And it was decades ago when this person said that. Anything else before we, um, we close? Anyone else want to say anything? So I, I hope this is something that you will all um, feel. Uh, I mean, I, I I just felt it was such a such a piece for me. I, I understand the sort of being determined part, and I'm really kind of good at being determined. But the piece that I was just so missing was that idea about really thinking ahead about what's required in order to do this, and then am I learning? You know, what is there? Uh, What's the wisdom in um, in progressing in this in this effort? And for me, that just really opens things up a lot. So I'm really um, for myself finding that um, a really uh, just um, very fertile area for investigation, um, as there is a lot of a lot to be done. In, in making our world more sustainable, more equitable, um, and in our own spiritual lives in the way we support each other. So I just like to um, thank you all for, for being here and hope that any, any merit that our practice together, um, there's any possible merit that we share it with each other, with our parents, teachers, persons, known and unknown throughout the world. And then I hope to see you here uh, next week. So thanks so much.